Welcome to Using Flashbots to Mint NFTs on Ethereum, Part 1. My name is Scott Bigelow, and I am a co-founder of Flashbots, a service that has been running on the Ethereum network for about a year, which has improved the way that bot operators and miners communicate while improving the overall health of the Ethereum network. In this talk, we will be discussing what Flashbots is, why you should use Flashbots to mint NFTs, and we will build a TypeScript-based bot live that will mint NFTs on Ethereum using Flashbots. We will not be covering what an NFT is or how you mint them. So if this is something that you would like to get more familiarity with, I will leave some links in the video description. I recommend checking them out before popping back to this video. Uh, in part two, we will be extracting MEV or maximally extractable value by minting NFTs with Flashbots. What I mean by that is in this video, we will be creating a transaction using Flashbots, which will send some amount of ETH to an NFT minting contract. And so long as we land the transaction at the right time, while this NFT minting contract is, is open for, for new mints, this contract will send us an NFT back. At the end of this transaction, we will be down one ETH and up one NFT. And it is up to us to determine whether this, this trade was worth it. In part two, we will add another component here, which is a third-party service called artbotter.io. Artbotter is a system that allows users that are interested in an upcoming NFT drop to place an order ahead of time that allows anyone else to fill that order and receive the ETH that the user has staked. This allows us to create a small little arbitrage here where we can buy an NFT during the time which this NFT minting is open, effectively sell this NFT to a user who has staked ETH, waiting for someone else to come along and buy the NFT on their behalf. And in doing so, we will receive their ETH that the contract was holding. At the end of this transaction, we will not have an NFT. We will have flipped this NFT for more than we bought it for. We will have 0.1 ETH extra at the end of this transaction. When we talk about extractable value, we are talking about transactions which are intrinsically valuable that anyone can run on the Ethereum network, but if you are the one to do so, you end up with more assets at the end than when you started. So what is Flashbots? The best way to understand Flashbots is to compare it to the standard Ethereum transaction propagation mechanisms. In this diagram, this here is a signed Ethereum transaction from an account that has ETH to use as gas. This could be created, say, by MetaMask, it could be created by your hardware wallet, but somehow you have created this transaction and you give it to the Ethereum network either via Infura or your local node, and this transaction will sit there and bounce around the Ethereum network being copied from node to node to node until eventually it finds its way to a mining system that is waiting to create a block with many of these transactions that it has discovered in the same way. And eventually these will become part of a block and they will be confirmed. Uh, so this is not how the Flashbot system gets transactions into blocks. Instead of operating on a single transaction, Flashbots operates on a bundle of transactions. This is many transactions that are indicated in a very specific order to be included atomically. Instead of giving these transactions to the Ethereum propagation system, there is a Flashbots relay, which is a hosted service that can receive these bundles. It will perform some lightweight inspection on the bundles to make sure that they are valid and profitable enough to be of interest to miners. And it will send them along directly into these miners' mempools, waiting for the next block to get created. And then they will appear all of a sudden, not having been seen in the pending pool previously. So why would you use Flashbots to mint NFTs? Many of the NFT minting systems have restrictions in them preventing smart contracts from participating in these sales. In part two, one of the things we wanted to do was to mint an NFT before selling it. And we would like to do that in the exact same block. We do not want to be stuck holding this NFT while somebody else filled this order. We really would like to buy and sell in the exact same block and not maintain any price exposure. Using bundled execution, we can have multiple things happen in the same block, even as the components we're acting with do not allow contract interactions. We also get pre-confirmation privacy. 
By sending transactions directly to these miners and avoiding this pending pool or dark forest, we don't give our competitors a chance to see what we're doing until it's too late when it appears in a block. We also get revert protection. One of the agreements that Flashbots enabled miners have is that if a transaction that you submit reverts when it executes on chain, it won't be included by the miner. It will be discarded and the next transaction will be selected instead. This is a set of transactions from an NFT drop of something called 8-bit token. And these here are the newest transactions and these are the oldest. This is Etherscan, which sorts backwards in, in some cases. Uh, and we can see here that these users were able to successfully mint one of these tokens and later transactions were not able to do so. Right here in this, in this one block is the cutoff point for when this NFT sold out. All of these users, not only did they not get an NFT, they still had to pay the transaction fees associated that, uh, that caused their transaction to revert. So they are out really two things at once. Okay, now that we've covered what Flashbots is and why you would use Flashbots to mint NFTs, let's jump into building a TypeScript-based bot that will mint NFTs using Flashbots. To do so, we are going to be using the Gourley Ethereum test network. I have two contracts here that I have previously deployed. Uh, one of them is called Waste Gas, and we're going to be using this one first as a demonstration to make sure that we have the Flashbots library working and can submit real transactions to the network. Uh, this Waste Gas is a very simple contract that simply receives any transaction sent to it and uses all of the gas available. One of the things the Flashbots relay confirms before sending the bundle to the miner is that a bundle uses enough gas to be interesting to the miner. There is a amount of gas. If you use less than, the relay will give you an error saying, please use more gas. This is not something that's actually extracting value. So this contract really just bypasses that check. Let's create a Flashbots searcher or bot which targets waste gas and lands real transactions on the Gourley network. Okay, here I have a skeleton TypeScript project. I have no code and no interesting libraries installed here. I have some of the important TypeScript bits here, but nothing related to Ethereum has been added to this project yet. So one of the first things that we want to do when we are working with Ethereum is to install an Ethereum library. Uh, my favorite library here is the ethers.js library. It's a, it's a nice modern library with well-defined TypeScript interfaces. But because the Flashbots Relay is not an Ethereum service, it has different API endpoints that aren't covered by ethers.js with proper typing and, and, and friendly return types. So we have our own bundle provider. This is a Flashbots plugin to the ethers system that allows you to communicate with the Flashbots Relay in a, uh, a developer-friendly way. Uh, okay, and now we have these two dependencies installed. This is all we're gonna need from dependencies. So let's go ahead and start coding. Uh, let's pop open a TypeScript file, index. Let's just make sure uh, we have TypeScript working here. So we'll say, how about hello? So let's say um, TS node, which is a, a, a quick little tool that will run TypeScript for you without requiring it to be compiled first. Um, we say, hello. I also have an IDE run button here which does the same thing. Uh, the only difference being that when I run via my environment, I have a environment variable already loaded up that has a private key for Gourley that we'll be using. Okay, so let's start, um, let's start coding. Well, we're gonna be talking to Ethereum. So one of the first things we're gonna need is we're gonna need a Ethereum provider, which is an interface that Ethers gives you that allows you to communicate with an Ethereum endpoint. So we'll say our uh, Ethereum provider equals Infura, we're going to be using the Infura system to talk to Gourley. And I happen to know that network ID 5 is the network for Gourley. Uh, we'll go ahead and add an import here. And uh, I'd like to make this thing a little bit more friendly. So let's go ahead and say this is our chain ID. We'll be using that later in our transaction. Uh, and let's say, uh, how about provider.git block number. Just make sure everything is working. Uh, this is an asynchronous JavaScript function, and we can't add an await here because we are not in an asynchronous function. So we can just wrap this uh, into a method and say, great. 
So now that we have this in a asynchronous method, we can do this and let's actually uh, make sure that we output it, right? Let's go ahead and write this to the uh, terminal. So I'm running this, which will cause us to reach out to inferior, get the block number, print it. So it, the inferior portion of this is working. Now let's make this just a, a little bit fancier. Let's go ahead and uh, grab every single block that comes in. Whenever there's a new block, I want to call a function that prints the block number. So get rid of this one. And now instead of printing it once, I'm going to run this thing. Uh, we're going to connect to Infura and every time a new block comes in, we are going to run this function, which will just output block number. Okay, great. So that's it. These are Gorley blocks. Okay, now let's start interfacing with Flashbots. To do that, we're going to need to instantiate that Flashbots bundle provider that we installed earlier. The way you do that is there is a Flashbots bundle provider. There is a create static factory method that returns to us um, an object that we can use to send bundles. The arguments here are the generic provider. Because the Flashbots relay doesn't actually have any request you can ask it, you can't say estimate gas, you can't get a nonce, you need to give the Flashbots bundle provider a real Ethereum provider that can allow it to help you um, build your bundles by asking questions of the Ethereum network. Uh, AuthSigner is the way that Flashbots does user authentication. You get to make up your own user, effectively uh, creating your own wallet. So we can just say, let's just create a random wallet. Um, this is used to kind of establish a reputation with Flashbots to, um, they can recognize when you send a lot of profitable bundles and if you are a, um, a consistent relayer of profitable bundles for the miner, uh, they can prioritize traffic based on that. And then the last thing is the connection string. This is the Flashbots relay to connect to. And uh, I just recently read the doc, so I know that this is relaygorley.flashbots.net. Uh, and let's go ahead and just dump this into a constant. I'll call this flashbots end point. Great. Okay, so now we need to, this is a, an async. So we'll need to await this and we'll say flashbots provider equals this. So now we have our flashbots provider object. One of the unusual things about the way that you send transactions to flashbots is that Instead of sending a transaction once into the pending pool and waiting for it to be included by a miner, you must resend a Flashbots bundle for every single block that you want it to be included. This allows you to effectively cancel a transaction by just not sending it anymore. You, can, you don't need to try to replace this with a transaction at the same nonce. You can just say, you know what, whenever this process dies, that bundle should no longer be included because it isn't targeting any of the blocks. All the blocks I was targeting have passed we need to start sending a bundle every single block. That's why we set up this provider on block. So we can say, let's take this, this Flashbots provider. We want to send a bundle. Well, these bundles are multiple transactions. So we have an array here. Uh, the array wants us to specify transactions. We will be, we'll come back to this, but let's kind of get this, this, this function call basically happy. Um, and it also wants a, a target block number, right? It wants to know which block would you like these transactions to be included in. Uh, well, we know what the block number is. This is the current block number. Let's just always try to land our transactions in the next block. So whenever we discover a new block, we try to land whatever bundle we come up with here in the very next block. And this is going to happen for every single block, whether we land or not. So let's start building the transaction details that will create a bundle of transactions that will get sent along via the Flashbots relay. Uh, we do this by submitting a transaction description along with a signing wallet. So we have new wallet, and this comes from provider.env. I called it wallet private key. This is the environment variable. Uh, sorry, not end. This is process.env. Um, so this is the environment variable I mentioned that is being included when I run this process. Uh, and let's go ahead and extract this into a variable like we do all of our things. Call this the wallet, perfect. An environment variable is something that might be present when this thing runs or it might not be. Uh, and so actually if we run this, let's go ahead and uh, try, to, try to run this, we're gonna get a failure. This is gonna get upset 
because what it's saying is, hey, you know, this, this environment variable here, wallet private key, this could be undefined or it could be a string if you presented it. Um, and you are passing it to something that is not expecting an undefined value. So by running logic here, so say wallet private key, if it equals undefined, then console.wall, how about console.error, uh, please provide wallet private key, and we'll do a process.exit here. Now, when we run this, TypeScript has recognized that we have taken care of the scenario in which, uh, see, there's this a different area, we'll, we'll, we'll fix this. But um, it, it is recognized that this can no longer be undefined because if it was, we would have exited. This is one of the really nice things about using TypeScript. Um, and uh, the error here, right, we should give it um, a provider as well. This allows us to run uh, estimates later in, a, when, in, in the Flashbots provider send bundle process. Okay, so now that we got all this intermediary work done, let's start building the transaction that we would like Flashbots to send to the Gorley network miners. Uh, so we can start asking for the kind of things we need to provide. So a chain ID, we already have that, it's five. Uh, type, we're gonna use a type two transaction, which is EIP 1559 transaction. Uh, we're gonna use a value of, well, we're just wasting gas, right? So we're just gonna say, how about value of zero? Expects a, a big number. What else do we have to, uh, to add? How about uh, gas limits? Well, we know we need to waste at more than 42,000 gas, 50,000. It's kind of a nice round number. Um, data, we don't really need to provide any data. Zero X is the way that uh, you say null. And uh, let's start dealing with gas price. Uh, we need to say, well, what is our base fee? What is our max base fee that we're willing to pay? EIP 1559 has made this actually a lot simpler when you're trying to do demo transactions. So we just need to provide kind of a, a reasonable number here. I don't even need to go look up what the right market value is here because it'll just select whatever is reasonable. So this here is the way that you say GUE. So this is, you know, 10 to the ninth is a GUE. And let's say, how many GUE are we willing to pay? How about we're willing to pay three GUE for our base fee. And we are willing to pay for our priority fee. Um, actually, you know what, we're gonna reuse this. Let's go ahead and take this. And let's turn this into a constant because this is the, the GUE. We can just reuse that in our, our next thing. Way. Uh, we'll say, how about we're willing to pay this much for our priority fee? Uh, and the last thing we have here is two, right? This is the, the destination of our transaction. Let's pop over here to our, our waste gas. Copy that address, pop over here, and say two is going to be this, right? This is, uh, this is the specifying the waste gas contract address. Uh, we're going to waste. 50,000 gas, but we're gonna do so by sending a bundle to Flashbots. This is not going to be sent along to the standard pending pool. Uh, I think we have everything here we need to run. Uh, let's go ahead and click it. Now, not every miner on the Gorley network is a Flashbots miner, and so there is gonna be several blocks that, that go by here where we don't get included, because if the Gorley miner that mines that block is in Flashbots, it will not have received this transaction. It has no chance of including it. But we do have a Gorley enabled miner. So when it's that miner's turn, so long as we get this transaction to them in time, we will see that this contract here has an inbound transaction. Okay, there we go. We have our transaction that did not show pending and all of a sudden showed up in a block. If we take a look at the transaction details here, we can see that this transaction has all of the details that we specified in our transaction description on send bundle. We have our destination. We have the, the various gas prices we, we configured. Here's the 50,000 gas and true to form, the waste gas contract wasted all of our gas for us, um, ensuring that this became a valid bundle in the eyes of the Flashbots relay. But wasting gas isn't really what we came here to do. We came here to buy NFTs. And so I set up a contract here called Fake Minter. This is already deployed on the Gorley network as well. Let's take a look at that. Uh, and this is a very, very pared down implementation of what the contracts on mainnet look like for minting NFTs. This is a fake ERC-721 
contract, which is the, the you know the standard usually used for NFTs. Um, and we you know we deploy this ourselves, our our own fake NFT ish contract. Um, but this contract itself here is the fake art minter contract, which has a function in it, which requires you to send some bit of ETH, in this case, 0 0.03. And we will, if you do so, mint an NFT directly into your account. We will emit a message. And then the owner of this contract, of the fake art minter, me, uh, will receive the 0 0.03 ETH that you sent in order to buy this NFT. So what we need to do is take the example that we just created, and instead of calling 0x or you know, no call data, we need to call this mint function. So let's pop over here. So let's really just change this system to target the mint function of a different contract. Uh, well, one of the most obvious changes we'll need to make is we're targeting a new contract. Just grab, copy this address, uh, paste it. Um, 50,000 gas is almost certainly not going to be enough to, to do all the things that this needs to do with minting the 721 and forwarding the ETH. Um, but one of the really nice things about this Flashbots provider is that this gas limit here is really an override. You don't need to provide it. And if you delete that attribute, the Flashbots provider will recognize that there is no gas limit provided and perform an estimate gas in order to populate that at the last minute before signing your transaction and sending it along to the Flashbots relay. The rest of these transactions look good, except for, well, value, right? We decided that you needed 0 0.03 to cause that function to succeed onto the, the mint. Um, so let's actually make sure we're sending that, that value along. Well, how do we say 0 0.03? Uh, we can say, well, how about, well, 10 to the power of 18 is, uh, is an ether, right? So let's go ahead and make this a, uh, a constant ether. All right, so we have our, our going on our ether here. Um, but right, we don't want to spend, send a full ether, right? That's too much. We need to say, well, how about an ether divided by 100 mole 3. This is how you say 0 0.03. Uh, you could also say big number dot from and pass it a string. But this is a, this is a nice, elegant way to, to, to pass value and be able to change it easily later. The last bit of information that is needed here is data. This is the call data that is passed to the contract that needs to make sure that mint is the function that we are invoking. Um, there are, there's a lot of ways to come up with what this call data is. Uh, Ethers itself has some really nice utilities around uh, ABI parsing, but we're going to skip all that and do the really, really easy way. We are going to say connect to Web3. I'll choose MetaMask. Yeah. Etherscan has access to our Web3 object. We'll go to Mint. Uh, we can say, well, this is the, the, the amount of Ether to include in it. Uh, if there was other parameters, you would, you would have text boxes for them here. And we'll say write. Okay, we have our MetaMask pop up here. Uh, and all this is, is garbage. All that we really care about for this is the data tab here under hex data. Etherscan and MetaMask have already done the, the ABI parsing that was necessary in order to figure out that this is the call data that you use to call the mint function. So we can just copy this, pop back over, we'll reject it, right? We didn't want to actually do this via MetaMask. Uh, we'll come over here and paste this. Uh, and this should be good to go. We now have changed our little demo here to target a different contract. And just like before, we are, you know, every single block sending this transaction to the next block target. Okay, we're hitting run here. Let's pop back over and look for inbound transactions to this contract. Okay, so there we go. Our transaction appeared out of nowhere. It was not pending. It appeared suddenly in this block. And again, if we go look at the transaction details, we see all of the details that we specified. Um, the gas limit, right? We didn't type in this number, but the bundle provider was able to estimate that this was the amount of gas required and populated it without us doing anything. Uh, we have all you know the same gas fees as before. Uh, Etherscan is able to say like, oh, well, this is, this is the mint function that you called, reversing it from the data that we passed. Uh, and here we can see this is our, our NFT mint, right? We were able to actually get, you know, token ID six of this fake NFT contract. And, you know, here's the 0 0.03 ETH right here. Um, right. So, so this is the way that you can target arbitrary contract functions uh, using MetaMask simply to extract the data that you need for the call data, which is really that, that missing part. And I'm sure you're thinking that, uh, well, you know, you're not really trying to mint these fake tokens. You're trying to mint, uh, you know, some, some other token that you're interested in. 
Let's take a look at a couple others and see how we might have used a similar system to mint those NFTs. Uh, this is a production token called 8-Bit. Uh, it was the same one that I showed before where it sold out and there was those failures within that same block. Um, and just as before, we can go to contract, write contract, and you might need to do a little bit of digging here, but it's pretty obvious. We're talking about the mint bit. Uh, you know, this required some amount of, of ETH. You might need to, uh, you know, either find the, the value required for, uh, for minting either as a, a read. Let's see if we can do it here. Uh, a read contract attribute. Many times they'll have the, the price here. Perfect, right? This is the price. And in here, they want it as Ether. I happen to know this is just, you know, 0.08888. You might need to convert this value from way into ether to, to work it here. But honestly, this doesn't even really matter. What we're trying to do is just get the call data from this. Um, this is a good example here because you can mint a different number of tokens depending on the call data you pass. So let's say that you in your flashbots wanted to mint three. What we can say right here, after connecting the MetaMask, don't forget that. Um, you can say three here pop over the data, uh, this data is a lot longer, right? So we have here the function signature and then there's the three, but it's gonna be really important that you kind of, you copy this entire thing uh, before coming back, you know, and, and, and pasting it along here with the correct um, destination of the minting contract. Uh, how about another one? This is the, the Board Apes Yacht Club. Go to write contract and here we go, mint ape. Again, you can figure out some amount of ether. You might need to, to read it uh, either from the contract source code or from here. Here we have eight price, perfect. Uh, we can say number of tokens, I don't know, how about seven? Let's get greedy. Uh, again, connect your Web3 provider. Got it, seven. This transaction, of course, isn't going to succeed. The uh, you know, Board Apes is not open for minting, but we can still use this as a, as a good example. Again, here we are, we're getting that, that hex value. This is one way that you can look at a contract and use a system like Flashbots to figure out what that contract needs called on it. And instead of doing so with MetaMask, you can instead bring that data into Flashbots and have Flashbots do it on the back end and get all of those benefits that we'd previously discussed. So let's just walk through a couple of quick things we might want to add to this. Um, well, this is a send bundle, which is a function that returns um, a promise of a very useful object for submitting bundles. Uh, so let's go ahead and say, I would like my, uh, let's say, um, bundle submit response. Uh, and of course, this also needs to be an async function since this is a callback. So we have this submit response here, and this does not throw when it has an error. This returns uh, an error as a kind of a more standard response type that is not fatal. So one of the things we need to do before we start interacting with a submit response is make sure that it is not an error response. Uh, so you can just say, you know, if error in bundle submit response, then we'll just say, let's go ahead and log the error message. So it's gonna be bundle submit response dot error dot message. And we'll just return. So that way we know when something bad is happening, but it's not something that we, we need to handle right now. Um, but since we've done so, we now know that bundle res submit response is not an error object. It is a, uh, a successful response object. We can, have, we can call this wait function, which is a promise that will wait until the block we have targeted um, hits, and it will tell us about what happened. Were we included or not? Uh, we also have a simulate. This is a very, very important function um, that allows us to, even before the target block has come, to ask the Flashbots Relay to simulate what would happen if this, if this was included, which can tell us if our overall bundle is working properly. So I'll go ahead and uh, just console log this, and I'll hit run. We're going to submit this bundle, but before that block even comes, we have asked the relay to tell us about what happened, specifically uh, what the Coinbase diff is, right? This is what we are incentivizing the miner with by what we are willing to pay the Coinbase. Uh, so this can tell us, you know, whether this thing reverted. This will tell us, um, you know, if this thing had a EVM response, it would tell us what that EVM response. If there was an error, we would see that here. So if you're having problems landing a transaction, this gives you a chance to see it because you don't see it on chain the same way that you see when you actually land a transaction and figure out what's going on. This is the alternative to that, and it's free. You don't need to pay any of these revert fees to, to get this data. You might also want to put something here like a 
um, a gas price getter. So, you know, so we have here what the, the, the max fee per gas is and max priority fee, and these are static. If you are trying to get into an NFT airdrop, that could be a very competitive thing. This might be a great place to call some sort of a function like, you know, get reasonable gas price that looks at, you know, what, what were people paying in the very last block to get into this NFT? And can I copy those values and add 5% on top of that? Because many of these gas stations that will tell you what a reasonable gas price to use aren't expecting these massive gas price changes that occur within just a few blocks while these NFT drops are happening. And you might need to... Um, you know, create your own gas price oracle that is more targeted to these sudden changes in gas price. If you're interested in learning more about Flashbots, I invite you to check out docs.flashbots.net, where we keep a lot of up-to-date and useful information about how to interact with Flashbots. We have a lot of concepts we haven't covered. We didn't cover uh, how bundles are priced so that we can select one bundle over the other, uh, Coinbase transfers, paying fees without using gas, uh, RPC endpoints, where you can learn how to interact with the endpoint yourself if you didn't want to use the uh, the Flashbots bundle provider. Uh, we have the searcher reputation system where we created that random wallet that we didn't use. There's a bunch of information here about you know why you might use that and, and how to take advantage of it. 1559 examples. Uh, we have other libraries if you wanted to use, say, you know, Go. We have a Python library. We also have our GitHub if you're interested in more example searchers to, to base your work on. And our Discord is a very active place, especially for searchers or you know, people who are writing bots. There is a, a channel there called Hashtag Searchers with um, a lot of really helpful people helping others get their bots up and running and sharing strategies for how to extract that, you know, that 0 0.1 ETH from Ethereum. Okay, and that's it. So don't forget to subscribe to get notified when part two comes out where we learn how to turn uh, 1 ETH into 1.1 ETH. I'll see you then.